Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is Season 1, Episode 4, and today we are talking with Ted Gerard and John Mercer from UNLV's Department of Kinesiology and Nutrition Sciences. Ted and John are both experts in athletic performance, and we visited their lab to form a series of sports performance testing, including a VO2 max test. Listen to this episode to see if Chris or John has a higher VO2 max and to learn how you can use sports performance testing to become a faster cyclist. All right. So Ted and John, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great. Having a great day in Las Vegas. It's beautiful here as, as usual. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, guys, we're so happy to have you in the show. We have a lot of great info to cover today. Uh, I just want to talk real quick about how we met. Ted, you and I met years ago swimming in a master's group. Yes. Yes. Calvary High School. Yes. <laughs> Ted is a fellow Canadian, so naturally we hit it off right away. And Ted, I'm going to say this with all due respect, but when I met you, you could hardly swim a lap. <laughs> and you have turned yourself into a top age group competitor on a world stage. So very impressive. Well, th thank you very much. I still think that uh, I don't swim very well, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. Um, it's interesting. My wife uh, refers to you because you, I think you helped me a lot in my swimming, believe it or not, as uh, the Canadian swimming whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, and then, John, you and I met a couple of years ago, and I had always heard about you from students uh, who were working in your athletic performance department. And a good friend of mine, my best friend in Vegas, is a urologist who I actually think we're going to have on this show. But he's in your age group and he's a great athlete. But every time there was a race, you always beat him. And he always talked about that Mercer guy. Uh, is that Joe? <laughs> yeah, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, Joe's great. Joe's a great swimmer. And I actually always liked having Joe at a race. I'd spot him out. Because when we swim, we swim about the same pace, but he drifts to his right and I drift to my left. So I would always line up on my left so that we would sort of run into each other and keep each other on track. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So you're both great triathletes. Um, this is going to be a really interesting show. So um, for those listening, John and I visited Ted and John in the athletic training department of UNLV. And while we were there, we both did a VO2 max test. And of course, we made it a big competition. So we will definitely get into the test and the results. But on this show, I'd really like to discuss a list of different tests that you can do as an athlete in a laboratory setting. And then I'd like to talk about how you can use those results to improve your athletic training moving forward. So let's start with lactate threshold training. Um, one of the first times I heard about this type of testing was during a conversation with Kiwi Pro Mark Bosted. Great guy, super talented athlete, and we were talking after 70.3 Worlds in Las Vegas. So I was picking his brain about training, and he had mentioned that he's, his heart rate zones were all based on a lactate threshold test. So what he told me was that the training zones that are published in training books or sometimes given to you by a coach are based on averages that work for most humans. So for example, zone three is typically 76 to 90% of your functional threshold power and 84 to 94% of your maximum heart rate. So where this approach falls short is that all athletes vary by a small amount. So if you're in high zone three, it could be low zone four for others. So that means we could be unknowingly training in the wrong zones. So a lactate threshold test can help us address this problem. So Ted and John, let's just start with you explaining to us what a lactate threshold test is and how it's performed. Great. Okay. I'll take this one. This is John. And uh, lactate threshold is um, the way we test that is we do the test that you both actually did, and that's a graded exercise test. 
And a graded exercise test is simply what it sounds like, is you do a, a um, incremental intensity test that we try to start off um, exercise at a real light level, and then we go to a point where you don't feel like you can continue, so exhaustion. And we try to do that test over about a 10 to 15 minute window. Uh, and the whole idea is to keep making it harder and harder at specific time intervals to, uh, to reach a point where you're uh, finally exhausted. For our lactate threshold test, what we would do, or one way to do this, is we would uh, take blood samples throughout the duration of that test. So it starts off easy, you do a little finger prick, pull out a little blood, test the amount of lactate in it, then we bump up the intensity, do another finger prick, uh, look at the blood and look at the amount of lactate in the blood again, and we continue to do that at regular intervals of the test. And then uh, what you do is you plot out uh, how much lactate is in the blood during the duration of this test. And what you'll see uh, very typically is um, lactate will be um, really at low levels, at the low levels of intensity of the graded exercise test. But at some point, the amount of lactate that shows up in your blood starts to take off and accumulate really uh, quite a bit. And you can pick that out visually uh, pretty easily by looking at, at the amount of lactate over, over time. And the threshold idea is uh, to pick out that intensity that lactate starts to accumulate at a greater rate in the blood. Wow. Perfect. Perfect. That's pretty cool. How accurate is a lactate threshold test? Super accurate as far as, you know, what, but it's really it's only as accurate as when you get the blood, right? So that's one of the issues is we pull the blood at, at varying increments. So the, the, when I did it, I did it about six months ago on myself. Every two minutes we were taking uh, a sample. And the problem is, is that you have to slow down to get the sample, right? Like it's really hard, especially when you're running, to take somebody's blood. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's a, a little bit of a limiting factor. So for me, I would every two minutes take the blood, but it would take me probably another one minute to get my heart rate back up to where I was uh, when they took, you know, when we took the blood out. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that. You know, it, it's a little bit, little bit of a limiting factor. I mean, if we could have, you know, for example, like a cannula that we could be just pulling blood out constantly. Obviously, that would be that would be really cool to do. Um, so you know, it, but it is pretty accurate, especially when you get near the near your lactate threshold, um, and you can see the inclination on the chart quite quite easily, right, John? Yeah, you can. And there's a couple of things that that influence how accurate it is, and you can actually draw blood from the earlobe too. Uh, we used to do that you know, when I was down doing my thesis work, uh, prick the earlobe, and sometimes that's a little easier to get the earlobe versus the finger because you're running and trying to especially at the higher intensities. Okay. Uh, but it is um, how accurate it is or how um, close to intensity it gets dialed in on is uh, influenced by how frequently you sample the blood. And then also how your test is built, how incremental the stages are. Okay. So I did mine. It took, it took over 20 minutes to do but because I wanted a really slow uh, – I wanted to do, my, do very slow increments. Mm -hmm. So because I really wanted it to be more accurate. I didn't care – you know how long it took when I when I did mine. Yeah. Um, and the yeah. other thing that I was looking for, and I, uh, and I know mm -hmm. you, you know, we've talked about it in the past, and you've even talked about it on a, a previous podcast, is looking at like the um, maximum aerobic function or uh, or math number. And mm -hmm. so, so to get that number, you actually have to go pretty slow in the beginning. Okay. Um, and see, you know, see the first in basically the inclination in um, in, in the blood lactate. So. You know, it, it can vary. You could do you could do the test over a half hour or longer um, if you wanted it to be you know to have more data points. Basically, are there Very any cool. are there any environmental factors that come into consideration, like your diet for the week, or you know that day of a test, or anything else like that that come into consideration when you're looking at a lactic threshold test? So we do try to standardize some instructions coming into the lab for a test like that. Um, you try to have, you know, not, you know, if you're not eating within two hours of the test, that's probably a good place to start. Okay. Um, but the, the issue is, is when you're going to start having more lactate show up in your blood, when you reach an intensity that, uh, you're not getting enough energy through the aerobic system and you need to start tapping in a bit to the anaerobic system. So environmental factors that would influence which energy system is going to start 
kicking in and when uh, would come into play at that point. Okay, cool. Okay, very cool. When you actually do the test itself, what values do you receive from the threshold test? So lactate is just measured in uh, parts of uh, the amount of lactate in the liter of blood is what the units would be. Uh, but what we're really looking for is where that lactate starts to accumulate at a faster rate and then looking at the intensity of exercise yeah. or the heart rate of exercise at that point. And that's really the output is uh, the heart rate or if you're doing cycling, looking at the power. Okay. And so when you once you get this threshold number, how do we take that and apply that to an individual training plan for ourselves to help us improve our training? So, so I looked at it in, in two ways. So first of all, I looked at it because I really wanted, for me, I personally wanted to know the minimum, or sorry, the maximum aerobic number. Okay. So because I wanted to do like math type training. Yeah. And so, you know, if I took the, you know, the standard of like the 180 minus your age, um, and 45, so it's 135. Right. So I wanted to know the, that lower number. So when we did my, uh, my number and my testing, basically I saw the first inclination that my lactate was starting to move up at 138 beats a minute. And so yeah. for me, that, that was my number I started using for that base training. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I obviously, I continued the test and, um, went up to, I think I got to 157, 158, which was my, um, uh, my lactate threshold. And then now I start using that for my lactic threshold test or training. So like, you know, in, in a lot of the training programs that you see, you'll see, um, you know, okay, let's do zone two or long steady. Well, then I know I need to be under 137. Uh, if I see, um, you know, at lactic threshold or higher, I'd go 157 sub lactic threshold lower than 157. So instead of taking, like, I think you mentioned it, instead of taking like the, the prescriptive model, uh, that's built by code, which is like, the, it's kind of like a guesswork. I try to take the guesswork out of it and use yeah. you know, those, yeah. those specific zones as far as heart rate. Now, what I'd like to do to follow up is to do the exact same thing on the bike and do it by via wattage, but I haven't done that yet. Which leads to an interesting question. Can you use lactic threshold results for both power and heart rate? So how can we use that with, with power training? So um, I take a, a little different approach with with this than, than Ted does. I look at the importance of knowing this threshold number. And it's not really – threshold is, is actually a, some debate out there as to whether or not we should be using that term because it, it in, implies that it, there's an on-off switch with, um, with what's going on. And really, there's <laughs> not. So what's really important to know is like right now, if we, if we did a, a, a lactate test and we pulled out some blood right now and tested how much lactate is in the blood right now, there will be some lactate. The amount of lactate in the blood is a function of how much is being produced without oxygen uh, when we're starting to convert something like glucose over to ATP, and also um, how much is being removed from the system as well. Uh, it's being pulled into other muscles and reused as a fuel, actually. Okay. And so threshold is sort of a funny term, but... It, um, the, the importance of identifying the intensity where lactate starts to accumulate in the blood at a fast rate probably is an indication where um, energy systems are starting to be used at a different proportion. So below that level, you're really uh, stressing uh, the aerobic system, uh, okay. how much oxygen you're using to produce uh, ATP and, and uh, muscle contraction. Above that threshold or at that threshold, you're starting to get more contribution from anaerobic uh, process of converting chemical energy to mechanical energy. Very cool. Okay. Very cool. Okay. So we're, we're touching on heart rate and power, and I want to get a little deeper into that topic. Um, it's a bit controversial, and we've had some guests on the show. Trainer Road is a big believer in kind of power only. We've talked with some co a coach who believes that you should use a mixture of both. Um, the power only approach for me, just with my own experience with training, I have to say I somewhat disagree with. And that's because I think our bodies are influenced by so many things. You have your environment with heat, elevation, you have stress, fatigue, hydration, all these things. So... If I were to do an FTP test, 
at sea level, well rested and not stressed out. And then I put myself in an environment where let's say I'm at 8,000 feet. I've had a heavy week of training. I'm a little bit stressed out. And then I'm supposed to be holding an interval that is 105% of FTP. That's not going to happen. So <laughs> with all of your experience studying human, human performance, can you give us your opinion on training with power versus heart rate? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on that one. Uh, okay, so um, when we look at power, the way, you know, mathematically we define that as force times velocity or rate of work done. Um, well, I like to uh, explain power with when I talk with people about this is it's really the rate at how fast we're transforming energy from one form to another. So we know, you know, light bulbs have wattage powers, you know, 60 watts, 100 watts. And we know that a 100 watt light bulb is brighter than a 60 watt light bulb. What that wattage is telling us is how fast that bulb is transforming electrical energy to light energy. The higher the wattage, the brighter the bulb. Okay. Well, in the human body, we do the same thing. We take chemical energy and we transform it to mechanical energy. How fast we do that is power. So it's transforming energy from fuel, you know, carbohydrates and fats, over to mechanical energy or force times some distance or force times velocity. Um, and so power is a great measure. And we use these terms like aerobic power and anaerobic power to represent how fast we're transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy, either using oxygen or not using oxygen. Heart rate is a great predictor of VO2 typically during exercise. And there's a nice equation that links in heart rate and VO2 is the Fick equation. And uh, it, it is a uh, heart rate is a good predictor of VO2 when we know um, the stroke volume or how much uh, blood is pumped with each beat of the heart and then also how much oxygen is pulled out of the blood as it's circulating through uh, through the system. If we know all three of those things, heart rate, stroke volume, and, and the amount of oxygen pulled out, we understand VO2 perfectly. So okay. heart rate, when we use that in the field, it ends up being a nice predictor of VO2 because the other two parameters are, um, they change predictably. They're also hard to measure, uh, especially in the field. Uh, so heart rate is limited in predicted VO2 because there's two other unknowns that determine VO2. Power is a great number uh, because mechanically it represents that transformation of, of energy from one form to another. Uh, and so I do, I think you can use both of them. They are, they are giving information about the same process, in essence, transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy, just from different perspectives. Okay. okay. Very cool. Do you believe that there is a t time when power is better? And if so, when do you think it's best to use power? So uh, I agree with John. I think that there's there's obviously positives for both. Um, I I think there's some really good times to use power. Number one, I use power to get myself an FTP. Okay. And then I okay. use that FTP to determine my racing. You know, like for a half <laughs> Ironman, I want to be between eighty and eighty five percent of my uh, of my FTP for that two hours and twenty to two hours and a half. Or a full Ironman, I want to be at seventy five percent or whatever. The prescription is so for me that's ultimately really really important as far as giving me a number because on race day i don't trust my heart rate no nope. like, there's no, <laughs> no you're right man there's the, too much else going on our heart rate or a power meter is the best tool you can have for racing bar none i think uh, absolutely if i had one piece of data when i'm racing on my on my garmin showing up it literally is power yes, right? yes. like it, that's you know it lets me know if i'm going too hard not hard enough um, so I think that, that that's like the number one thing for me for, 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 for power. Now, the other thing that I think is really interesting with power is it also lets you know when you're training, when you're being lazy. <laughs> I love, I, I, you know, uh, we'd actually talked about this a, a long time ago. You don't, you don't, you may, you may not remember, you mentioned to me when you were riding with Angela Nate that, um, you were amazed when she crested a hill, how she went down. Yeah. The other yeah. Side. And I don't know if you remember that conversation, oh, but yeah, it, yeah. it always kind of stuck in my mind. And what that is, was constant power, right? Yeah. Like so many times I'm riding with people and they go so hard up a hill and then they just crest and they take it easy. 
well, that's not good. If you're looking for steady state training, <laughs> that's not good, right? And no, so, no. And, and your heart rate may take a, a quite a while to come back down, especially if you really were, you know, were working hard, let's say, on the way up. But can you crest that hill and keep and maintain power? Like that to me is, it, it's pretty awesome. I look down, oh man, I'm 126 watts. What am I doing? Like right, I, right. I, I, fall, I fell, I fell asleep at the wheel, kind of. That's, so that's, I think as a practical application to me, like that's those are the two biggest areas that I use. Uh, I use power. The other uh, thing I think is really nice is just setting a power goal for yourself. So I think that that can be really, really valuable. So I can say, you know, from for the next 20k, let's say on a, on a, on a longer training ride, for the next 20k, I'm going to keep my average power uh, at 220 watts. Let's say. Yep. And, I, and I can stick to that number and I can allow my heart rate to drift and to move up and to, to do things and not not caring about that in that context. Whereas if I'm doing just purely a heart rate training, then I can watch my, you know, just stick to my heart rate and the power doesn't matter because I'm trying to, I'm trying to do two different things. Like one, I'm trying to hold a steady power. Another day I might be trying to uh, hold a steady heart rate. And okay. I think that we can train in both ways. And I think training in both ways is is can be very advantageous. So okay. let's fl let's flip the question then. You've said that there are certain times when power is great. When do you take heart rate sort of as a predominant factor? When is it really good to use that when we train? So I uh, well number one on days when I I want to go easy like a recovery day. Okay. You, you know because you I think you, you guys had mentioned it and even you know John uh, mentioned it is you have so many other factors, right? You have your your stress level, your work, your your life. You didn't sleep well last night, or those are all real things, right? So if I want to have a day of of an easier ride, let's say I want to go like two or three hours, nice easy recovery day. If my heart rate is elevated, I'm not recovering. Right. You know, I right. can be right. at a certain wattage, um, but the heart rate is telling me all of these other factors. So. If I go three hours and I say I want to be at 135 uh, heart rate maximum, uh, or I want to hold between 130 and 135 because I know that you know that's a, an aerobic number for me, I can hold that and it doesn't it doesn't matter. And if it's once again if it's hot, I'm at altitude, whatever the situation, that's my body's physiologic response, and it yep. is what it is. And I, you know, and and for, especially for recovery, I really uh, I really like that. So uh, just a quick story. I used to do a lot of heart rate training when I when I used to ride, and so in Las Vegas, which you guys know, there's a very beautiful ride. It's the Red Rock Loop. Um, it's like 13 miles. The first time I ever rode that on a bike, I was trying to maintain a heart rate, and <laughs> it's pretty much near impossible. <laughs> it's like the most up and down. It's absolutely beautiful. So you, like you see these amazing scenery, and I'm sure your heart rate spikes because of that. But I was like halfway through it, and I'm like. This was a really bad idea, so <laughs> probably a better power day if I was going to take that uh, take that ride again. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's a that's a really good message because heart rate uh, is going to give you a prediction of VO two. But if you start doing intensity uh, work or um, interval type work that starts incorporating more anaerobic uh, energy processes, then heart rate is not predicting the total intensity of the exercise. And that's what power right. and that's a bit better. So if you're doing lots of, you know, quick up and downhill uh, type of work or you're doing uh, sprints uh, and what have you, heart rate's not going to catch up uh, to be able to pick out the intensity at that point. Crazy. All and right. I think, so you need to, I think you need to, I think you hit the nail on the head. You need to kind of pick your pick your course. Your right? terrain. Like terrain. It matters. If it matters. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, if I'm going to do like a, a heart rate session, I'm not going to climb the Red Rock Loop, or I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go <laughs> Mount Baldy. I'm, you know, th th that's not the day to do that. <laughs> Bad choice exactly. for me. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so Ted, we we touched quickly on math training, and for those who don't know, math training is was developed by a guy named Phil Maffetone, and it's the system that. Mark Allen famously used to eventually win Kona. And the idea is you take 180, you subtract your age, and you get a number. So let's assume you're 30, you have 150. That's the heart rate that you train at or below for as long as you can. And your body gets better at burning fat for fuel instead of carbs. And eventually you get fitter and fitter and fitter, and it's hard to get your heart rate past that eventually. So I've used this in the past with success and Ted, we've talked in the past and 
the more and more you train, it seems the more and more you like that approach. So talk a little bit about math training and what you think about programs that use heart rate as strict uh, parameters. Yeah, I think, you know, once again, it's all in context. So I do my math training uh, or my aerobic training in my off season. Um, I want to build a bigger engine is how I think about it, uh, or a more efficient engine. Um, I, I find that, uh, you know, it just makes you, I don't know, the easiest way to say it, it makes you a better athlete as yeah. far as an aerobic athlete. And that's, you know, I'm doing mostly long course racing. Um, you know, I want to make my aerobic system work as efficiently as, as absolutely possible. And the truth is, in the least amount of pain, you know, if I, when I start doing my interval work, there's a lot of pain associated with that. <laughs> um, and I'm not just talking on the bike, I'm talking running, right? So if I do, you know, interval sessions running, it's very catabolic. Um, you know, there's a time I need to do that. But, you know, in the base season, I, I tend to do more, way more of the math training. And then on my recovery days, I do way more of the math training. Um, you know, there's something to be said about my, mitochondrial um, uh, mitochondrial efficiency that does play a role. But I also think when you're at that stage uh, of heart rate, you're also just becoming more of an efficient athlete, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. just time on the bike. So let's say I do 10 hours of week, a, a week on the bike. It's not even just my mitochondria that's becoming more efficient. I'm becoming a more efficient peddler. Right. You know? right. And I think there's something there's something to be said to that. Or if I'm doing a lot of hours running at a lower heart rate, I become a more efficient runner. Exactly. Maybe not at a higher heart you know, at, a, at a higher speed, but I, that's how, that's how I've always used it. Now I will tell you there is a point where it becomes difficult to go higher than your that that heart rate. Oh so, yeah. yeah. You know, for me now on on the on the bike, uh, I to go over my one thirty five, I've got to be working hard yep. to get to to get that. But I'm talking like two hundred and twenty watts at one thirty five heart rate, which is to me is pretty. I'm pretty happy with that. Right. Yep. Right? You know. No, it's crazy how it works. I remember when I did it, my number was one fifty at the time. And I had to push 250, 260 to break that. And it's it's crazy how well the system works. And then the thing is, is it really interesting? It, it transfers over into racing. You know, you put me on the start line and, uh, you know, the gun goes off. My heart rate still goes up to, you know, to, to close to maximum, right? And obviously right in the beginning. It's, yep. it's, not like, it's not like your heart rate, your heart's not able to respond anymore. It still responds. Exactly. It's, it's just the, the, the training, uh, the training, I don't know, just, it becomes, it does become more difficult to break that number. Yeah. Which yeah. is You have good. a bigger ceiling. You have a bigger ceiling. You know, the, the, the biggest, you know, problem that people have is being patient with it. Yeah. Right. You know, it, in the beginning, it was hard. I mean, oh. I was running around at 150, 155 all the time mm -hmm. and didn't really think much about it until I started getting into this. And, and I was like, well, now I'm basically doing the same wattage or, or more wattage at, a, at 20 beats lower. Yep. It, it took it took months. It takes forever, but it's so effective. It's so yep. effective. Okay. So you actually touched on neuromuscular efficiency. Yes. And that leads to actually the next section I want to talk about, which is neuromuscular recruitment testing. So that's a lot of fancy words together. And the last podcast we did was with, Revo Physical Therapy in Boulder. And um, those guys will sit you on a bike. They get you riding in the position that you're currently in. And then they use surface EMG to look at how efficiently your muscles are working in that position. And then they optimize your position and they can see gains of 10 to 12 watts over a two hour ride just by moving your position and allowing your muscles to work more efficiently. So I know that you guys also do neuromuscular recruitment testing in your lab. So can you start just by explaining this type of test and how it works? So we use uh, electromyography, so EMG. Okay. And what that does is measures the electrical activity of a muscle. So muscles are fired via the nervous system sending electrical signals down to the muscle that triggers certain things to happen uh, that ultimately result in the muscle shortening and generating a force. <clears throat> and we can measure those electrical signals by putting 
sensors on the surface of the skin. This is no different than doing EKG, electrocardiograph, where we measure heart rate. Okay. And we put stickers on the chest area to look at how active the heart is and how it's beating. Uh, the nice thing about a heartbeat is um, the heart beats pretty synchronously and uh, fairly predictable. Uh, muscle, um, are, the muscle fibers are all firing a little differently at a little different time, and so we don't see as clean of a signal as we would with an EKG or, or something necessarily as easily predictable as, a, as an EKG. It's also the same as an EEG, electroencephalogram, where we look at their electrical activity of the brain. So these things are all, all, all predicated on measuring the electrical activity of the system. So in our in our work, we put EMG, uh, we use EMG to look at how active muscles are during a variety of movements. We have people cycle, we put people running on different treadmills and different shoes, we have them run, run in the water, all sorts of things. And we look at how active muscles are during these movements, as well as how, um, how the muscle patterns are. That is, uh, muscles start to generate a peak force during a particular type of a movement. And then we also look at how muscles are being recruited relative to each other. So we start looking at coordination. And so um, in cycling, uh, we could put uh, sensors and have put sensors on different muscles and uh, looked at both the magnitude of activity, the patterns of activity, and then the coordination of activity of the muscles during uh, cycling or, or other movements. Okay. So what, what muscles do you look at in particular? Like if you're going to look at a cyclist, do you focus on the quads, the hamstrings, lower Glutes. leg? What are we looking at? Yeah, mo most of the time uh, we focus in on lower extremity. So okay. rectus femoris, vastus lateris, part of the quadriceps, biceps femoris, uh, the hamstrings, uh, gastrocnemius down in the lower leg, the calf, uh, tibia center, tibialis center, the front part of the leg, and then also the glutes or the, you know, the, the butt part of your uh, leg. Okay. Okay. What do you see when you look at muscle groups like that? Do you see something that is commonly, you know, the predominant muscle, something that is not functioning or under functioning in cyclists? What do you see? So EMG is, it, uh, on the lower extremity during cycling can be influenced by lots of things. Cadence being a big part and, and power as well. But in cycling, typically you see really nice coordination between muscles on uh, in the quadriceps and the hamstrings that you know, sometimes one firing and the other is quiet. Uh, and it's typically very predictable because the pedal stroke is constrained by your crank. And so it's very um, not too hard to pick out what the EMG pattern is going to look like for cycling. Very, uh, very predictable in terms of which muscles are going to be active at different parts of the pedal stroke. Okay. okay. Do you think that the one of the major limiters in muscle activation would be bike fit. Oh, sure. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, to just take something as simple as seat height, I mean, drop your seat down as far as you can go and you'll start firing muscles quite differently than if you raise <laughs> it up higher. Or if you change your cleat position on your shoe, uh, you'll start using your gastroc and your tibialis anterior differently simply based upon how you're able to push on the pedal. So, yes, no, it, uh, bike fit um, is, is going to be uh, really important in terms of how muscles are firing and how they're firing to, uh, relative to each other. Do you have any general tips for bike fit that, you know, that just from an athlete who doesn't have a, an EMG machine that they could look at and say, okay, maybe these could help me in my bike fit? So, I, I think number one thing is just it's got to be comfortable. If someone is in, in any pain whatsoever, it's not right for them. That's that, that's always my first thing. You'll be amazed. I mean, people are like, oh, this looks like when I'm in the mirror and I look at myself, I'm like, trying to, I'm in more arrow right now. Right. Yeah. yeah but, but it hurts. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, how long can you, know, can you can you stay there for two hours? No, but it's arrow, and you know, I, I think it's going to be fast. So that's probably number one. Number two is if you do have a power meter is just look at your power you know, get, get yourself on a trainer and actually quite simply like which position are you producing more power in that, yeah. that's a that's a, that's another way i also look at it is if one muscle group they feel they're feeling fatigue in one muscle group only um that might not be the most efficient for them either you know i quite often have talk to people and they're like oh when i'm riding it's only my, my quads are just burning 
well, you're probably not in a good position. I was actually working with somebody just a couple of weeks ago, and she was saying, oh, it's my calves are just, uh, they're on fire. fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, we need to do this. We need to move your seat a little bit this way. And it's still, you know, to, to, to uh, Alton. She's like, well, I've just recently had a, I had a bike fit like two months ago. I'm like, well, I don't think it's working for you if, if your calves are on fire when we've ridden like an hour. Yeah. You know, so I think that using common sense is important. I think that um, I, I do, I honestly, I do like using power with it though. It's, you know, you know, especially when you're really dialing things in. Um, uh, what, one of the things, and it's not necessarily the way you might think of, it, of doing it, is like to pedal, for example, at 200 watts. And does that, you know, how does that feel? And then move the seat, maybe one or two millimeters. Power, you know, cycle at 200 watts, which feels better. And so at the same, at the same, pa- same power, asking, you know, asking yourself, which one actually feels better at that wattage? Yeah, that's a really good point, and I think it's misunderstood and not used enough. I, your body just seems to want to know where it wants to be, and I've, gosh, I've worked with some top level pros with fit and trying to help them. And like you said, Ted, they obsess over this position or this, what looks or what their friends said. And so often I'm like, just what's more comfortable. And, you know, obviously you're not going to sit up in the wind like a billboard, but if you can't ride a bike, like you said, for four or five hours comfortably, you're not going to produce power because your mind's going to be somewhere else. I I think it's, Interesting coming from from our from our approach too. I mean, we spend time in a wind tunnel, and you think about things being as aerodynamically efficient as possible. And so, when you start thinking about bike fit, it's like, well, how do we make somebody very aero? But you know, the more you dig into fit, and the more people you talk to, like you say, you got to look at power, and power is so crucial. If I can add twenty watts to an FTP because of a fit, but I'm going to add a small amount of drag what actually ends up balancing out. And so I find fit is more of a, a, a art, I guess, as opposed to an, a, a perfect science, but you got to blend the two to, to get a really good result. So it's, yep. that's very interesting information. And let me just jump in. Uh, the, you know, the one, one thing that we, we look at here in the lab quite a bit is humans are inherently lazy. You yes, have to find yes. the easiest way to do things. And so uh, that's something to keep in mind that, you know, you are looking for that easy way to set up your bike so you are as effective as possible. But what's also really important is to recognize that bicycling is a skill. Uh, you know, we don't, no one hesitates to go into a, a swim workout and do all sorts of drills. Maybe 25, 50% of your swim workout may be stroke technique. Yeah. Yeah. But we ignore that when we get on a bike and, or often ignore it that we're not necessarily thinking that cycling is a skill. You do have to teach your, your muscles to coordinate uh, to be as effective as possible. And so, you know, some muscles cross two joints that you're asking those muscles to do two different things at the same time. And it, your, your body has to figure out how to recruit uh, muscles, when to fire them, uh, so that you're, you're making that pedal stroke as effective as possible. Nice. I've always found it so interesting when you, when you, you just said something like riding a bike is a skill. Right. And I think a lot of people look at riding a bike. It's like, well, I learned that when I was a kid. And if you ask people that are starting to get into cycling or triathlon, it's like, can you ride a bike? It's like, yeah, I can ride a bike. But the difference in somebody who's ridden 10 to 20,000 miles versus somebody who rode a bike as a kid is there's such a refinement, you know, and so it's, it's very critical. Yep. So John, 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 and I had a chance last year about this time to ride with uh, Alistair Brownlee, oh, and um, that could we just did a, suck. You know, a couple, a couple, a couple hour ride with him, and he was it was just after he won St. George, and he was going for a recovery ride. And it was amazing just to be behind him and watch him, yeah. like yeah. effortlessly spin those cranks. It was un. To me, it was unbelievable. And it's just, just to look at it and say, well, yeah, everyone can ride a bike. There's no skill to it. I'm telling you, there's an absolute skill to it. And, and when you're a cyclist, you can see it yeah. on something yeah. that's, yeah. that's truly I, I, great. I will second that story. I was in Mammoth last weekend and I was talking with a, a guy, a ski instructor. He's also a cyclist. He's six foot six, 
215 pounds and he was riding up in Reno with the guys at Trainer Road, actually. And Andy and Frank Schleck were on this uh, charity ride or celebrity ride with him. So they're climbing this steep hill and he starts to suffer. Frank Schleck, who I think weighs, I don't know, 120, 125 pounds, comes up behind him and says, don't worry about it, puts his hand on his lower back and right pushes him up the entire hill so that he keeps up with the rest of the group. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, amazing. Just that, that he's pushing an additional, you know, 100 pounds up the hill at that weight. So for those of us who are not so mer- neuromuscularly uh, <laughs> gifted, <laughs> gifted, do you have any tips that can help us improve our neuromuscular recruitment on the bike? Off the bike. Well, a lot of times you have to expose yourself to different situations. So riding at different intensity is an easy thing. Riding bikes in different environments, you know, mountain biking versus road biking. You know, doing single leg, doing, uh, you know, teaching how to contract your muscles with, with that being the only leg pushing the pedals. Um, and then also doing a trainer ride, a roller ride, doing all these different uh, perturbations or different environments. You can teach your brain to find the best way to recruit those muscles to be as effective as possible. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So how about you, off the bike? Yeah, you, yeah, you asked about off the bike. You know, and this is going to come from a, 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 probably a lot of other athletic trainers or people who might think I'm crazy, but I actually don't think there's many, many ways you could do it. I really, really? don't. So I know that people say, well, you got to lift weights and you got to do this, you got to do this, but we're talking about skill acquisition. The best way to yeah. get better at a skill is to do the skill. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little debate in Vegas between a few guys, and uh, huge, Ted, they're going to be happy. Said so. <laughs> there's a huge debate, but here's the thing: is that, that you know that that's my personal that's my personal theory on it. Like to be a better cyclist, you got to cycle more, and I think John's right. But in in in, in different contexts, right? Like there, you you're only going to get so good cycling on a trainer or at spin class at the exact same setting all the time. The perturbations come from changing cadence. From changing environment, from you know, riding in the wind, like riding in the rain. Like believe it or not, it rained here um, yesterday and the day before, and I was out on my bike. And one of the reasons is because you know I'm racing, and I, I don't know where I'm going to race, and it could be rainy, and I want to be a better bike handler, on better skill. You know, it's it's really an interesting thing. If we only just give us ourselves one environment, we're we're going to be stuck in that environment. I yep. remember when I first started riding a bike, and I was I would always take the bottle from the bottle cage with the same hand. And then one time I was like, I don't know what I was doing, but I went to go the other way and I'm like, okay, that's really weird. I'm like, why (laughs) is that? You know? And so it's just like those different skills. We're we're all dismount on the same side. I mean, just just try dismounting on the opposite side and it's, it it gets confusing. Do you ever try and stand up in the arrow bars? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, yeah. I think it's a good little skill. <laughs> First time you do it, it scares you to death. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about the VO2 max test that we did. Um, I will start by saying that it is a hard test. Um, my heart rate hit 198. John hit 197. And we are 36 years old. So that's pretty high. I will also say at the end of the test that I had blurred vision and Ted, you told me that means I did the test right. (laughs) So I will say that I was very lightheaded at the end of the test. I thought for a minute that I was going to hit the deck, but I held it together. And I guess long story short, I hit, I think we said 62 and John hit 49. Now I have a ton of endurance training under my belt where John really has not much at all. And when I used to race, I was in better shape. And I always guessed that my number would be about, you know, high 60s, low 70s. And Ted, you said that based on my lack of training lately, I was probably about 10% ish off, which is exactly where I thought it'd be. So I thought that was a really interesting fact. Um, 
So we're going to post the full results of this test in the show notes on the podcast page. So everyone can take a look at what kind of details you get and what you can expect to get from a test like this. So before we get to some specific questions, John, what was your take on the test? I mean, I thought thought it was really easy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, no it was it was a really cool test so i i think one of the things um i'll tell the story a little backstory it was kind of interesting i knew that the test was coming up and obviously i knew that i did not have i have not been on a bike um as much as i would have liked to uh before a test like this and i was actually on a river I was canoeing from like basically the Hoover Dam down. It was Sunday and it was like late at night and it was like very relaxing. I've probably haven't been that relaxed in a long time. And I came into the shore where we were getting picked up and I was like, do I have a VO2 max test tomorrow morning? And I was like, oh, so then I like started to psych myself up for it. And when I came into the room, you guys had it set up in a really cool way. You had Zwift set up. So there was like this visual component to the VO2 test where there were these stages. You could like see where you were going. And I thought that was like a really interesting way to do it because I think one of the hardest parts of the test is the mental component. And Ted said when I got there, he's like, I think one of the big factors for you is will your legs be able to get you to a point where we can actually get a true VO2 max value for you? And so in my head, I'm like, man, I I really got to dig in here if I'm going to make this work. So um, it was really cool to do. I had to really psych myself up mentally and I kept telling myself that my legs are going to hurt, they're going to fail, but I just got to keep pushing and because of the visual setup, I sort of had this mental marker where I was going to hit a specific wattage before I would even consider giving up. <laughs> um, and then I actually hit that. And then everybody around me was like so encouraging. It was like, well, I can't quit now. So then I just got to a point and I kind of got to a point where I didn't think I would even be able to get to. And I was like, okay, if I get there, I'll see what happens. And literally the second I hit it, I just, I, like, I, I had nothing left. It was it. Um, so it was a very cool test. Like, not only physically to see what you could do, but, like, where you could push yourself mentally and, like, not quit. So I love the test. It was awesome. I will say one thing. I found it a little interesting that you found the visual markers so encouraging because I closed my eyes the whole time. I hardly, I don't think I looked at the screen once. Oh, your, head was down, your head was down almost the entire time. Yep. I just go in my own little cave and suffer. (laughs) And then, you know, I wonder if that's, uh, Chris, because, you know, you have done a lot more training and a lot more training at that, you know, that that harder level that you know what that's going to feel like. You're more comfortable in that that environment. I also noticed, too, that with the results, my charts or my graphs looked a lot smoother than John's, where John's were a bit sporadic. And I think that probably has to do with just years of training. Agreed. Interesting. Um, Okay, so guys, let's just start with, let's talk about the test in a little more detail. So can you guys tell us what a VO2 max test is? So the VO2 max test, the whole idea is to start off at a low intensity and then uh, increase the intensity in uh, very small stages. But to get to a point within 10, 15 minutes to where you don't feel you can continue anymore. And so what you both described is exactly that, uh, that you, you hit a point where you could not continue, and that's a good VO2 max test, combined with uh, a graded uh, level of intensity. So you're not trying to make these big jumps in intensity. You're trying to make these very, uh, very even level of, uh, of stages uh, to the point where you just can't continue. So let me ask you guys this. Did you feel like when we, so we increased it uh, 15 watts every minute after the warm up? Did you feel that it was pretty intense or did you feel that that was pretty subtle? Well, I think there's a couple of things for me, John. Um, it was based on Chris's FTP. 
Right. So we're all going to agree that my FTP is much higher than Chris's. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm really getting at. But so I think that there was in the beginning, I was totally fine. And then at the later stages, I think that the jumps were probably a little bit aggressive for me. Um, now I was happy that I was actually able to get a true value because I just fought through it, but I would be interested to see what would happen with my results if it was a little bit more gradual and maybe tamed down a little bit for somebody who doesn't have the FTP that Chris has. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah. For me personally, I thought the 15 watt increment was perfect. And now that is based on my numbers, but it was just that just hard enough to make you, to remind you that you're, you know, in an FT, uh, VO2 max test. Yeah. Good. Cool. Um, okay. Um, so, so go ahead. If we have the results of a VO2 max test, how can we use those to adjust our training as an athlete? So like most people don't do a VO2 max test, but what benefits can we get if we have done one? So first of all, I think that pretty much anything we do as far as making us a better athlete, we need in every chance we have, we should quantify, right? So right, right. if we have a number now, and let's say you have a coach or you're going to do train a road or whatever, and you do a bunch of VO2 t type training and you don't see an improvement, well, then there's an issue there, right? If you, <laughs> you know, or we can see how effective that training was. Or, for example, you could do not do VO2 tra training, try something else, like try, I know we've kind of beat this to the death a little bit, but try math training. Does math training actually increase your VO2? Right. You right. know, that's the way I think you, you look at it is, is ultimately, is your training being uh, effective or your lack of training being uh, de detrimental? Right. So I think that that's the, that's the main way to do it because ultimately, uh, um, we are, you, you can't measure VO2 while you're on the bike, right? But now, fortunately from this, we do, you know, we were able to produce some, some numbers for you guys as far as your anaerobic threshold power. So uh, Chris, we had you at 255 watts and John, we had you at 210 watts. And, you know, that so that you can use that to help, you know, develop uh, a training program as well. But I really think it's a, it's more of a situation of test it, test Train, retest, and, and I'll add in that uh, there's a huge individual component here. Yeah. And uh, if you don't do testing, whatever that testing is, then you're relying on building a training program based upon uh, an average person or a group of people. Whereas we're all individuals, we all respond a little bit differently. So by getting some data points specifically on me or you or whomever. Now you can sort of dial in your training a little bit more or at least have data specific to you. Okay. And I think that this test was really interesting because Chris and I are identical twins. I mean, for people that are listening that don't know that, you know, you've kind of got these two individuals who Chris does a lot more training, has a lot more training history when it comes to riding a bike where John doesn't. And you can see the specific differences like the adaptations that happen when someone trains. So what you're saying now is it is very individual and I'm, I'm assuming even between the two of us, there would be differences, but it's probably the closest you'll get to seeing how training and this sort of stuff can affect um, someone's performance. Yeah. Perfect example because you both had in essence the same max heart rate. Exactly. So if you used a uh, heart rate and you built your zones off heart rate, uh, you would end up having two very different training responses because, uh, John, your anaerobic threshold is at a different point than Chris's. Exactly. Yeah, and a lot. What you're trying to do in those different zones is you're trying to stress different energy systems in different ways. And so your zones would actually have different meanings in, in reality. Okay. Let's talk about those anaerobic numbers really quick. We use the term FTP all the time. How does your functional threshold power relate to your anaerobic threshold power? Well, everyone's trying to dial into that, that number that uh, you can base your training on that um, indicates which energy system is really active. So FTP, and I think your, your listeners are well aware of this, but it's how much power you can sustain for an hour. So you'd be 
exhausted at the end of that hour. Correct. Uh, anaerobic threshold is somewhat similar to that. It's uh, the point where you start getting more contribution of uh, producing energy uh, to, to power the pedals uh, from anaerobic pathway. Uh, both aerobic and anaerobic are contributing, but you're starting to get more contribution from an anaerobic uh, system. So, okay. you know, using a hybrid car as uh, an example, you, you know, use a mix of gas and, and electric at different times, and, and maybe at some point you're using one type of, of uh, of the engine over the other or one type of fuel versus the other. Okay. So can you say that anaerobic threshold power and functional threshold power are about the same thing? Mm, not necessarily because functional threshold power is specific to an hour. Anaerobic threshold, if you stay just below that, uh, you could probably go uh, for much longer than an hour. Oh, Okay. I look at my anaerobic threshold as something for like a, a you know, if I'm going to do a two or three hour time trial or like even like a half Ironman, yeah. I just keep it just a little bit, you know, I'd want to keep it just a little bit below that. I couldn't keep my FTP there, obviously. Okay. Or I couldn't, of course, I couldn't ride at FTP for that amount of time. Well, I'm, I'm happy with that number being out of shape as I am. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad Iron, or half Ironman split with that number. So I'm going cool it, it would be, it'd be pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so two more questions. Uh, the first one is, are there any tests that you can do in a laboratory environment that we haven't covered today that you guys would suggest people look into? Well, we also do, um, well, one, it's important to know that uh, the type of test we did on the bike, we could do on a treadmill. Yeah, yeah. And it, we'll get different numbers. And although we don't do it in the swimming pool, you can also do this in swimming. The, the methods of, of doing it are just a little bit different. And you would get different numbers yet again. And so it is important to start looking at sports-specific uh, data as well as uh, you know, just looking and interpreting these data for, for cycling. Uh, but uh, another test that we, we do for running more so is a running economy test. So how much oxygen you're consuming for running at race pace or training pace. Wow. Okay. Very cool. You know, All right. I, Go ahead, Dan. I, I think that, you know, and I, and I would be remiss if I didn't say this. I think that just doing like a functional movement screening and a functional movement testing is something, you know, we, we obviously do that here with our athletes. Um, I think that a lot of times triathletes or even cyclists um, become so limited in the in their available motion. Oh. And I think that that's something that, that, that should be tested and once again addressed and retested. I think it's critical. I mean, you can, if you know somebody cycles, there's a posture that some cyclists eventually get because of the position that they hold on the bike all the time. Yep. And it's, it can be crucial for, you know, like you're saying, like a functional screening test just to see what you can and can't do. And if that is so limited, that creates some major problems. Well, especially if they're, you know, they have a sedentary desk job as well. So exactly. then they're in that hip flexion, knee flexion all the time. <laughs> Does it <anyway>. exist? <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's adding to the problem. Yeah, yeah. We actually touched on that with the guys at Revo Physical Therapy. They said that hip flexor mobility or lack of uh, extension is so prevalent with cyclists and people who work desk jobs. Yeah. Yep. And if you, you know, just watch, you know, watch when somebody gets off the bike at an Ironman. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see that the, you know, the hip flexion, you know, when they're trying to run is, is in the, or the lack of hip extension when they're trying to run is what's causing them to not be able to run fast. Exactly. So not uh, be able to run. Yeah. Watch it in Kona every year on TV. It's crazy. You can see it every, <laughs> yep. every yep. all the time. And we're talking about elite level guys as well. It's Absolutely. Not, it, it's not just your, your, your typical age group. We're talking true. high level people. Yep. Okay, this is our, I will, I'm going to call it famous at this point question that we ask every guest on the show. And it's called our what point question. And the idea behind the question is if a listener takes the advice given on the show and applies it to their training, their bike fit or whatever, how many watts will that be worth? So I'm going to phrase the question this way for today. So we've talked about a lot of tests and all of these tests are really about the fine tuning things that we can do as an athlete to optimize our fitness. So let's take an athlete who's fit 
and they have a 300 watt FTP. Now let's assume that they're following a generic training program. Maybe it only focuses on heart rate or power and not a mix of the two. And let's assume that they have a decent, but not great bike fit. So let's take that athlete. Let's do a lactate threshold test to perfect their training zones. Let's optimize their training program and have them use power when it's optimal and heart rate when it's optimal. And then let's fine tune their bike fit with some surface mount EMG to make sure that they're using all of their muscles as effectively as they can be, as they can. How many Watts is that worth over a season? That's a heck of a question. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, no, we're you get a range. We're college professors, <laughs> and uh, you asked us the final exam question uh, for yeah, well, doctoral level class. I'm an engineer. You know how many final exam questions I get? I finally get to give one back. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask your question. Uh, answer your question with the question first. How much time do we have? I get a year. Get a season. You get a season. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll let, uh, I'll let John answer first, then I'll give you my, my I uh, like this. interpretation. Oh, nice. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to say, well, knowledge is power. And uh, in, this, in this podcast, we actually covered probably about uh, two courses worth of 15 weeks of material in an, <laughs> hour, an hour. And so I would actually say that's worth quite a bit of, of lot points in, in, in amongst itself. Um, but, I'll, yeah, so it's... Um, I'll say a point a week uh, that we cover in a semester, so that's two. So I'll say uh, 15 to 30 watts. Nice. Okay. So I'm going to approach it from – this is funny because I'm more of the uh, qualitative guy. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually look at your numbers, and I'm going to say um, – this is off of you guys. Okay. So being, being twins, one sort of you know, not trained that much, one trained pretty well, and we had an anaerobic uh, threshold power difference of – 45 watts. 45 watts. So I'm going to, I'm going to go out and say 45 watts. Wow. Okay. But that's, you know, and, and I, and I think it's possible, you know, um, it's absolutely possible. I don't know if you heard uh, any interviews, um, recently from, uh, from Tim Reed after, uh, after Oceanside. And he said, I, I got to head up to Boulder and find 30 watts. Really? That, really? that was a quote. Cause you were talking about, um, you know, him being able to beat Jan Ferdino. Yeah. Okay. So obviously he thinks that it's possible at his level to go find 30 watts. Um, he's talking about doing it, you know, obviously in, in relatively short order. I, I think 45 watts is, if you followed all of this and you did testing and retesting, did the bike fit, got everything dialed in, because it's all, you know, it's all little pieces. It's 15 right. watts right. here, it's 10 watts there, it's 15 watts there. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 45 watts. I, Love that's, it. I think it's fair. And if Reedy can find 30, Yep. All of us can find 45. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because he's already at the upper end, right? Yeah. 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 Obviously. I mean, 70.3 world champion. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, guys. Um, first of all, thank you for being on the show. This has been a very enlightening episode. And some exciting news for you guys. You are actually in the process of developing an athletic training facility in Las Vegas. That's correct? Uh, yeah, a uh, more broadly we call it a sports science uh, institute. Okay. Awesome. Where can so all of our listeners are going to probably have a ton of questions about this. They're probably going to want to do some testing on their own. How can they learn more about you guys, the testing, and all of that stuff? Well, uh, we we actually don't have a web page yet, but we do need to put one up. Okay. Uh, okay. We have a satellite lab that we built out at uh, Lake Las Vegas uh, Sport Club. And we're launching a, our sports science out there, and we're, we're trying to uh, sort of build on that and actually build something even bigger than that. Uh, so one, uh, you know, going to UNLV's uh, webpage and uh, finding my webpage, uh, John Mercer, uh, is, is a place to start. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. Great. All right, guys. Again, thank you so much for having on the show. Um, it's been a great episode, and our, our listeners are going to really love this one. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. 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 Take care, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to listen to episode five, where we interview the owners of RestWise to learn how proper recovery can help you become a faster cyclist. If you enjoyed the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. 
If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L-O-C-Y-C-L-I-N-G.com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe.